There are two aspects of the message of the book of Revelation. One often hears in the church that it is a fearful and frightening book. And to be sure, there is an element of judgment in it. Because a part of the transformation from the old to the new does involve judgment, condemnation, and punishment. And all those who at the end of history are still complicit with Caesar are judged, condemned, and sent to be with Satan in an eternity of fire. That is a part of this book with which we have to contend. The other side of the book of Revelation, though, is strengthening, encouraging, uplifting, it is unveiling a future that is, by human terms, unimaginable and in strictly human ways, unattainable. It speaks of God acting through Christ in behalf of the world in such a way as to regenerate and renew, a renewal that is already beginning and which we can feel even as parts of the world deconstruct. We have the powerful sense of God constructing and reconstructing, which gives us the strength to stand. I'd like now to review three or four of the elements that go into this picture of Revelation as it is so widely accepted among scholars today. It was written by John, which John we don't really know. There was John in the circle of Jesus, but he would probably have been too old by the time the book of Revelation was written. There was John who wrote the Gospel of John and the letters of John, but the vocabulary of the Gospel of John, the way in which the characters speak in the Gospel of John, and most of all, the theology of the Gospel of John and the letters of John is so different from that of the book of Revelation, it is hard to think it was written by the same person. Most scholars today think that the author of the book of Revelation was an early Christian prophet whose name was John and who may have had a prophetic circuit going among the seven churches that are named in the book of Revelation. And I just remind you that in this setting, a prophet is not so much like Amos or Jeremiah, as a person in the Christian community who received messages, visions from God, rather like you receive uh, information from a Wi-Fi broadcast system, and the prophet would then announce these visions, these messages, in the context of the community. Most scholars think that John wrote about the year 90 to 95, uh, when the Roman emperor was just on the verge of being declared divine in a rather full sense by the Roman Senate. And so we have at the very center of the Roman Empire not only the notion of empire, but a figure whose very being became a function of idolatry. The empire ruled by way of violence. It was a socially rigid group. If you were born into a particular place in that society, you largely were destined to spend your life in it, and it was incredibly hierarchical uh, with patrons or elites at the top, only 1.5% of the population, and nearly everyone else in the bottom part of the social pyramid obliged to pay social respect to those at the top. John objected to this system, Jewish in background. He was fundamentally repulsed by idolatry, committed to a peaceful way of change in the world, would not do one of the things that was required of many people who lived in the Roman Empire, which was to go to a cult, a worship space, set up in behalf of Caesar, and make an offering and then to make a confession that went something like this, Kaiser Curios, 
Caesar, Caesar, Curios, Lord. The Greek language does not require a spoken B verb in order to express a complete thought. Caesar is Lord, which of course is in direct conflict with the fundamental early Christian confession, Jesus, Curios, Jesus is Lord. Likely because of John's unwillingness to make this kind of public declaration, John was exiled to the island of Patmos, a small volcanic island set in the middle of the Aegean. Cobalt blue, the Aegean. Today, if you visit Patmos, you see those shining white buildings under the gleaming sun, and it's almost idyllic. So it's important to remember that in the days of John, it was a banishing point, a place where people were sent so they would be out of the main flow of the empire. John writes to seven churches, there is some uneasiness in scholarship over whether these are the seven churches actually named, the prophetic circuit, which I mentioned, or whether they have both that reference and also the symbolic reference, drawing from the fact that they are seven, that John intends for this vision to be circulated among the many churches of Asia Minor. Whether it's just the seven or the all, the point is this is a vision that is intended to be transported from church to church, delivered rather like a sermon by the prophet, and its purpose is to strengthen those who are in the congregations. Now, one of the most interesting developments in the interpretation of the book of Revelation over the past generation is a shift in movement from one point of view to another. Uh, when I was doing my fundamental work on the book of Revelation a generation, two generations ago, most scholars believe that the congregations were under some kind of persecution or felt the threat of persecution, and so the book was written to encourage them to stand up and witness. The more recent theory holds that many people in these churches were in danger of accommodating themselves too much to the Roman Empire, not understanding God's purposes and God's plans as fundamentally different from those of Caesar. So they would say, pay your dues to Caesar? Why not? John writes instead to say, the barrier between the realm of God and the empire of Caesar is sharper than you think. And you need to stay on God's side of that barrier by not accommodating to the culture. Come out, come out, he says later in the book. Meaning, I think, insofar as you can, establish an alternative social order. And so the book of Revelation is written to encourage people to take this step to assure them of the absolute sovereignty of God so that as they withdraw from the structures of Roman society, they will understand that the structures of the providence of God are at work for them. So the positive side of the book of Revelation is offering people the promise of the strength of God to stand and make a witness over and against the dominant culture. The other side of the book of Revelation is that it does contain a sharp threat that if you do accommodate and do not turn away from Caesar and complicity with the empire and its ways, then you stand under judgment and will follow the same fate that befalls the Roman Empire, which is eventual destruction, and its leaders and those who are 
implicated in its life, condemned to punishment forever with Satan. So as we turn now to the text of the book of Revelation itself, in this session and the following sessions, we will give attention to several visions as ways of getting an overview of the main theme of the book of Revelation. I will explain how people in the world of the first century would have understood each of the elements of the vision and will do so uh, with the help of a drawing. Just by way of background, people in antiquity often thought in images and they carried around within them large bodies of literature put there by memory in a way that many people do not today. And so a writer like John could assume that he could use a word or a phrase or a sentence and it would resonate in the resonance chamber of the self and people would bring up from the first 39 books or from other Jewish literature associations that help them make sense of the vision so that things that seem really strange to us, more than one student I have had over the years says it sounds like John was eating the wrong kind of mushroom. These things sound strange to us, even bizarre, but they would have been familiar to people in the world of the first century. And by the way, there were many books that were written in this kind of language in the world of John. Well, the first image in the book of Revelation occurs in the latter part of chapter 1. It is a vision of one whom John calls like the Son of Man. The vision pictures the Son of Man in the middle of a circle of candles that I would draw a uh, lamp, lamp stands that I would draw like this. You can think of this as the lampstand on which there is a little lamp, something like a saucer with a little edge sticking out, a wick in there, and a little flame and a little bit of smoke rising up. These seven lampstands we learn from the book of Zechariah represent community. The vision of the cosmic Christ takes place in the midst of the community of the church. And the central element here is this one who is like the Son of Man. I regret this gender-specific representation. The image is not on the man part. The image is on one like a human being, which is the way some of the newer versions render it. But even that is not entirely satisfactory because one can so easily get the impression that it is a human figure when in fact the emphasis comes from Daniel chapter 7, 13, and 14 where the Ancient of Days in awesome whiteness sitting on the throne looks down on the earth, sees the need for judgment and redemption and looks over among the heavenly beings and calls out one who is similar to a human being and appoints that entity as judge and redeemer. So he is really the heavenly judge and redeemer come down to earth, dressed in a long robe, which was a symbol of power and authority in those days, wearing a golden sash. Most people in antiquity would wear, men in particular, would wear a short work robe, rough cloth, not a long robe, and their sash, as it were, would be a rope into which they could insert tools and other things. 
the fact that this is a sash indicates power and authority. The fact that it is a golden sash, even more. The head of the heavenly judge and redeemer is colored white. Of course, as a person would have been in antiquity, it would have been more a person of color than a European type person. But the emphasis here is not on the quality of the facial features, it's on the luminescence of the whiteness, which echoes the whiteness of the one who is on the throne, the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7, and also the same color that is ascribed to Jesus resurrected in the resurrection stories in each of the Gospels. Reinforcing the idea that he comes into the world with heavenly presence and authority. And his eyes are like flames of fire. We learn later in the book of Revelation that fire is often associated with judgment. The eye means that he can perceive what is really the case. You can't mask over things in the presence of this figure because he can see right through and he comes seeing what needs to be judged and consigned ultimately and finally to judgment and fire. His feet are burnished bronze. And while this is not so evident in the English, had we the Greek version of the first 39 books in front of us, there would be notable similarity between the language of these feet and the language Ezekiel uses to describe God riding across history on the great chariot. His voice is like many waters. If you've been to the Niagara Falls, a block away, you feel the earth shake. And as you get closer, you can almost not hear yourself think because of the crash of the water over the falls. The end-time writers, like John and others, often used the great flood with its tremendous roar as a way of speaking what would happen on the way to the great transformation. A great destruction would take place beyond which there would be new life. And from his mouth comes a two-edged sword. Per the book of Hebrews, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. While there's no direct literary dependence between Hebrews and book of Revelation, the quote in Hebrews illustrates a way of thinking about the word that was popular in Judaism of the period, that this is not a bludgeon, this is the word that he speaks, and its two sides are judgment and redemption. And his face is like the sun shining in full strength. Now you don't have to know anything about Caesar and Caesar's court to be struck by the power, to be feel the awe that comes in response to this vision. But it happens that Caesar in his court was often arrayed in ways that are similar to the one like the human being, the Redeemer sent from heaven also as judge. And John intends from the very beginning for readers to sense this contrast. You have Caesar, the pretender, 
who rules the empire with violence. And you have Christ, the ruler of rulers, as in the gender-specific language later, king of kings, sovereign even over Caesar. And John's message is this. Once you have met this Christ, the cosmic ruling Christ, what can any Caesar do to you? This vision, the conquering, risen, ruling, cosmic Christ, is the lens through which to understand the rest of the book of Revelation. It becomes the axis on which to pin all the other visions. They all take place under the aegis of this confidence.